Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue to seek and find what our real faith should look like. Uh, we're continuing on, and we've been in the Sermon on the Mount for quite some time, because I believe with all of my heart that is true Christianity. That is the training of Jesus Christ to his, his apostles and his, his disciples in the beginning, training in righteousness. So that's what we're seeking today. And before I do, Alice is going to pray and ask God's blessing on our time together Amen. today. Amen. Father, we just praise you, we thank you, we bless you. And yes, we ask Lord. you, Lord, to guide us and direct us today in the study of this word, this precious word of yours. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we ask that our hearts be open to receive yes. all that you want us to receive and that we will be changed by this word today. We just ask you to bless everyone that's watching this, listening to it, especially listening, Lord, because that's where our faith comes from, hearing your voice. We thank you, Lord, for that. We bless you and thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And by the way, Al said, you know, hearing his voice, obviously... I'm sitting here, and I'm going to do most of the talking for the next half hour. But faith doesn't come by hearing me. No. Faith only comes by hearing the Lord. So I pray that, that God will speak to you through some of this. And after, don't, don't let it end when the, when the video goes off. Mm -hmm. Continue to seek God, to meditate on His Word, to contemplate and think about what we're talking about here today. That because it is his voice that will change you. Amen. And he will continue to talk to you after this video goes off. I promise yes, you. Will. The question is, will you listen? Yes. Hallelujah. So we ended in our last uh, program talking about prayer. We were getting into the whole concept of prayer. And talking about, well, we really don't know how to pray as we should. I mean, that's actually what Paul wrote to the church in, in Romans. But then, let me just say this. It, it says, if we do not know how to pray as we should, right? then Jesus and the Holy Spirit do. Yes. And Jesus has provided the instruction for prayer. So let me start by reading these verses in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. And by the way, I pray that you have a Bible and maybe a notepad, make notes, ask questions. You can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. But above all, test what I say. You know, that... We're to examine all things and hold fast to that which is good. Don't take my word for it. Check it against the word. That will make it real. The reality of when God speaks to you through his word will make all of this real. Thank you, Lord. So let me start there. Matthew 6, verse 5. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Okay, when you pray. That's how he started, when you pray. Exactly when are you supposed to pray? Unceasingly. Well, the Lord spoke clearly through the Apostle Paul to answer that question. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. That's when you're supposed to pray. Always. You know, Jesus began his parable of the widow who was persistent in seeking the favor of his judge in the Gospel of Luke in the 18th chapter, and he said, now, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. At all times. And again, the Apostle Paul instructs us to be devoted to prayer. 
He wrote that uh, to, the, to the church at Rome, Romans 12.12, 12, to the Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 6.18, to the Colossians and 4.2. I mean, this is a theme throughout the entire New Testament. Yes. Is there our prayers that are because, because it's communication with the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's what we talked about in the last session. Have you missed that? Go watch. So he says, and he said, do not use meaningless repetition. In Isaiah, it says, Isaiah 29, 13. Then the Lord said, because his people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. What does rote mean? It's just you've memorized it, and you say it over and over and over, right? Jesus, by the way, quoted that very scripture when he said, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Mark 7, verses 6 and 9. How, how much of our prayer life comes out of just rote? Mm -hmm. what you were memorized. Um, think for a moment about the prayers that are said, and perhaps even we ourselves pray, mm -hmm. that are just indeed repetitions of words that were learned by rote. Now, I, I'm going to be really prayerful about this, but dare I mention the, the rosary? Mm -hmm. I mean, consider the fact that, well, half the people on the face yes. of this earth that call themselves Christians are indeed Roman Catholic, yes. right? And they have, listen... Alice and I were both raised Catholic, mm -hmm. we went through Catholic schools. I actually did graduate work in a Catholic seminary. I, I know of what I speak. But the fact of the matter is, you know, are we not being so repetitious, re repeating a prayer to Mary, the mother of Jesus, pleading for her intercession with God 30 times in a row, mm -hmm. Okay saying the same prayer over and over and over and over. And I, if you, you can do yourself a little experiment here when this is over, just pick a word, any word that you're very familiar with, and say it over and over and over and over, and, and you'll see after a little while, it loses all meaning. And yet the popes through the years have always said that the rosary is among the finest and most praiseworthy traditions of Christian contemplation. Another prayer, so common in the church, Words that are so often repeated without thought or understanding is the one that we're about to examine. Mm -hmm. The one that is often called the Lord's Prayer. All right? By the way, it is not the Lord's Prayer. It is the model for the church to pray. Okay? Um, the Lord's Prayer, you know, the heart of Jesus is revealed in the most complete revelation that we have of his praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. All right? That's, that's his prayer, I'll tell you. He prayed to surrender his will to the will of the Father. And I've talked about this a lot, you know, the song. I love the song, I Surrender All. And I, and I caution people, if I'm somewhere ministering and I ask for that song to be sung, if you don't mean it, don't say it. Yes. You're, you're responsible for all of the words that come out of your mouth. And people say, well, that's a difficult thing. Surrendering my will is a difficult thing. Of course it is. It is the process of truly dying to self. You want to know something? It was difficult for Jesus. Yes. It was his will to surrender his will. But listen to this verse from the Gospel of Luke, Luke twenty two forty four, And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he was praying, not my will, but thy will be done. You think it was any easier for him? He, he was truly man, truly yes. God, but truly man, with a nature like ours. So, well, with a body like ours, it's hard. But if your prayer life is not surrendered to the will of God, you'll have no real prayer life. Not at all. Mm -hmm. You will be saying, it's easy to say words just repetitiously yes. and not have any meaning to them. But I promise you, that's not the desire of God. And you'll find out the hard way to do that. What is that? I mean, what is the purpose of prayer? Why do we, why do we pray? 
oh, I need this and I need that. And I want, you know, the purpose of prayer is to get us to listen to God. I, I, I talked a lot in our last program about prayer is not talking to God. It is talking with God. It is conversation with the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That ought to excite you, okay? But the purpose is to get us to listen to God. It's not about changing God's mind. It's about changing our hearts. So often we go into prayer and it's like we're telling God what to do and how to do it. You know, it says, let a man examine himself. Examine yourself and see if that's part of your prayer life. All right? And not only how and and what to do, telling him when to do it. Oh, well, yeah. We, remember, he's Lord, we're not. That's okay. Right. And, and before you start to pray, it's always well to remember the Lord's instruction through James. And he said, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak. So slow to anger too. Yeah. We've got to be quick to hear and slow to speak. There's a very, very simple logic to all of this. You know, James also said, the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Our prayers should have effect. Yes. But then Jesus said, uh, that was James 5, 16, by the way. Let me give you the scripture references so you can go back and check yes. what I'm saying. Jesus said in Matthew 21, 22, and all things that you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. But that belief can't be, you know, what you dream up. It says, you know, in Proverbs 3, not to lean on your own understanding. Because it says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. The believing is faith. And the faith comes by hearing him. This may be one of the most important verses of all when it comes to prayer. And this is what John wrote in his first letter, 1 John 5.14. This is the confidence which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, it's a done deal. That's, that's my right. paraphrase, but go read it and see that's not what it says. So if we're praying according to his will, how do you know what his will is? You see, you will certainly and truly know God's will in your life when you begin to pray, when your heart cries out the Lord's Prayer. Father, not my will, thy will be done. Okay? So it's that circle, but it comes around, and it's always about the will of God. And that should be our heart's desire, is to be walking in his will, not our own. That's right. You see, I, I, listen, I, we've been traveling and I've been preaching and teaching for 40 years now. And I've been to a lot of places and I've heard a lot of people say, well, it's like the heavens are closed. It's like my prayers go up this high and drop to the ground. So if it ever seems to you like the Lord is deaf to your prayers, it can only be that you're being deaf to his word, mm. to his will. That's right. And I say you, well, you know what? That applies to me, that applies to Alice, that applies to all of us. Because God can't do anything wrong. Yes. God is not, you know, he's not dead, okay? Uh, the Lord's hand is not so short and it, it, that it cannot save, neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. Isaiah 59, right? God hears, but he can turn a deaf ear to prayers that are not in his will. Mm -hmm. The confidence we have comes from praying what we know to be his will in our life. So anyhow, then, so the, the apostles, they, they asked, the disciples came and they asked Jesus to teach us to pray. Luke 11, 1. So he gave us, Jesus gave us in the Sermon on the Mount, the Our Father, what we call the Our Father, right? Mm -hmm. But bear in mind this. What Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus heard from the Father. Remember, it says in the Gospel of John, the twelfth chapter, that Jesus said he did not he did not speak anything; he did not hear from the Father. Why do you think it says in the Gospel of Luke, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus spent the night in prayer prior to giving the Sermon on the Mount? Because he was getting the Sermon on the Mount. He was receiving what he received; he passed along to us. So here it is. I'm just going to read through it once, and then we're going to go back and we're going to take a close look at this prayer. Because this is the model for effective prayer in our lives. The model, not to repeat the words by rote, by memory, 
not to repeat them from our brains like that, but to, re to, to pray the prayer from our hearts. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's not a very long prayer, is it? Yeah. Well, Jesus said the Father doesn't hear you for your many words. It's not about the amount of words you say. It's about what's in your heart that God is searching. Okay? And by the way, in the King James, in Matthew 6, 9, it says, After this manner, pray ye. So this is a manner of prayer. It is a model of prayer. It is not words that God wanted us to memorize and just repeat by rote. I mean, that, that should most assuredly be clear. Well, you know, it's not always clear. I can remember many, many years ago that I was asked by a, um, actually by a Catholic church in upstate New York while I was going through the seminary. I went to, you know, I did graduate work in a Catholic seminary. And they asked if I would come in and teach the teenagers Teach them the Our Father. This is for, for kids that don't go to Catholic schools and they have weekly, what they call CCD classes. So I was more than happy to do that. I was more than happy to do that. The problem was I had no intention of going in and just getting them to memorize these words. I was going to do with them what I'm doing now. And that's let us approach this and see what the Lord is teaching us about how we should be in conversation with the Lord. Well, that did not really go over well, <laughs> because that's not what they expected, nor what they wanted. But shame on you if your prayer life consists of words that you have just memorized, mm -hmm. that are coming out of the back part of your brain, rather than coming out of the depths of your heart. I'll let it go with that. And by the way, there are different kinds, there are, in this sense, different kinds of prayers. There are individual prayers and there's corporate prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, when you pray Our Father, we're talking about praying together. And it says, if two of you agree touching anything, I mean, there, we need to be praying together. But there's also times, and Jesus talks about that here in the sermon, that we go off into off to our own in secret and pray and communicate with the Father. But effective prayer comes when we pray what God wants and when we listen to him. And anything that we hear from God obviously is going to line up with the word because it is the word, right? So it starts with our Father who art in heaven. Listen to God. Ephesians 3.12 says this, This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him, God the Father. So we, have, we are supposed to, when we pray, we're supposed to have a boldness in our prayer. Yes. Because we have a confidence that we have access to the Father. Then we can talk to him. He's our father. Yeah. And that's because of Jesus, the high priest, who is at the right hand of God and also intercedes for us. That's Romans 8.34. Jesus Christ, he ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. And he is there always to make intercession for us. And he, this is so, so important. I, I, I think this is revolutionary. It can revolutionize our lives. Mm. Unlike the people of old, the, the Hebrews, out in the wilderness, who would not even dare approach the mountain where God would meet with Moses. Right? They perished. But now it is said to us, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 4.16 we, we are called to go boldly before the throne of grace. They couldn't, even, they couldn't even step on the mountain without perishing. You know, the temple the, in, in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the Holy of Holies, this place where God and man met at the, at the mercy seat, right? Where the name of God resided. Only the high priest could go into that. Mm -hmm. And him only once a year. Until Christ died on that cross and the veil rent from top to bottom. God tore that veil apart. Okay. We can go into the presence 
of our Father with confidence, with boldness. Think I, I'm just going to read some verses because they're so important in the context of what we're looking at. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. Exodus 15, 11. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not take, show partiality nor take a bribe. Deuteronomy 10, 17. God is not partial. He will not hear the prayers of Paul the Apostle or Peter or John or Andrew. He will not hear their prayers or did not hear their prayers any more any more likely than he will hear your prayers. He doesn't show partiality because we approach him in the name of Jesus Christ who intercedes for us. You have this authority to go into the presence of God Almighty in the name of Jesus Christ. And he will hear you if you're praying according to his will. The rock, and he's the only rock, by the way. Amen. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he, Deuteronomy 32, 4. And you know, in the book, it, it ends here in Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Remember, there is nothing impossible with God. Yeah. When you go and you're, you're in your prayer, don't limit God. Okay? Because if you're listening to him, he puts no limitations on himself. That's right. He tells you to, to step out of the boat like he did with Peter. When Peter said, you know, that's you, Lord. Call me. Nothing is impossible with God. You have to have that confidence that he is a God of might and power. And what he calls you to do, he will equip you to do. And he will not only make possible, he will create on the spot. It will do the impossible. Because there's nothing impossible with him. God is in heaven. Recognizing he is where we are not, right? Mm -hmm. His ways are higher than our ways. His wisdom is perfect. Now, having said that, I want to remind you of what Paul wrote. That we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Okay? These, these are the paradoxes of the word. All right? You should... Always be in the presence of God. For you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Because we're in Christ, right? We are in Christ. And he sits at the right hand of yes. the Father. Yes, and please, that verse, that, that phrase is so often repeated in the New Testament. Yes. This is, you know, we just had an incident, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, mm -hmm. sidetracked, but we had an incident here in Orlando, Florida, just before we were recording this, a couple of days ago now. Where uh, and Alice and I, were, when we're in the States, we're based in Orlando. Um, we travel all over the States when we're there, and then, of course, we spend most of the year overseas. But people were saying to us, you know, as we were preparing to come and travel through Europe, we, you know, through we Spain and, and Paris and London and here in England, and then, you know, going, we're going to Eastern Europe here shortly and uh, hopefully getting back to Africa. I don't know. And people were expressing their concern for us. You know, you're going to these places, you know. Well, the fact of the matter is, and we were telling them, we're not concerned. You know, he has us in the palm of his hand. He's, he's watching over us. Nothing's going to happen to us that God doesn't allow to happen. That's no, there's no better or safer place right. to be. But they were expressing all this concern for us. And now, just a couple of days ago, yes, a major terrorist attack happened. Where did it happen? It happened in Orlando, Florida. Right. Literally five miles distant from where we lived in Orlando before we took off on this trip. Mm -hmm. There is no place safe in the world. Let me say that. Okay. There is no place safe in this day and age in the world. Except that you be in the hand of your Father. That's right. Except you dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. That you are in Christ. That is the place of safety. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay? If you're not sure of that, if you don't have that confidence, please go talk. Spend time talking with Thank him. You, that you might hear the Son of God say to you, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. That you would hear that he pay, gives us a peace. A peace that passes understanding. A peace that the world can't give. give. That's right. Don't fear those who can kill the body. All right? 
we've died and our life is hidden in Christ. You can only die once. It's appointed unto man to die once. Let your prayer life be confident. Yes. Pray believing. Yes. Pray understanding that there's anything that you are asking in God's will yeah. is possible. Yes. No matter how impossible it looks like. That's right. I mean, I have seen, I have seen people healed miraculously like that. I have seen people delivered. I have seen, I mean, Alice and I have seen so many miracles. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you about one prayer, and then I'm going to, we're out of time already. Years ago, many, many years ago, Alice and I had a bus that we had converted into a motorhome so we could travel around the U.S. ministry. And uh, it, it was a conversion, and we had two 50-gallon tanks for, for fuel. I was going to say petrol, for gasoline. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the only problem is we didn't have a fuel gauge that worked in the bus. So there were times when it get a little scary. And we were driving somewhere in the United States. And all of a sudden the bus began to sputter. And we were on the second tank. We had run the, and I had run the tanks dry because I didn't, I wasn't <coughs> prayerful enough about it. So we're down, going down this road and there was nothing there. And I remembered one thing. Those who call upon the Lord shall be saved. So I literally, I, I'm driving this bus, and I stuck my head out the window, and I hollered at the top of my lungs, Jesus, help! And the bus went sputter, sputter, and drove down the road about another mile, where we pulled into a gas station and filled up without any problem. It's not about how many words. It is about what's in your heart. And in your heart, you need to know that your Father, your Heavenly Father, loves you. How much does he love you? He loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on a <coughs> cross in your place. What good thing would he withhold from you? Hallelujah. What good thing would he withhold from you? It's about the love of God. When you begin to have that confidence, you will know that when he is not answering a prayer, and by the way, when, you're, when you are, have that confidence, he'll always answer your prayer. Amen. I mean, I, I think a great example there is the Apostle Paul, when he was being tested, and he said he had this thorn in the flesh, and he went to the Father, he went and he prayed, oh, Lord, remove this. No answer. He went again, and he prayed, Lord, please remove this thorn in the flesh. He went again the third time, and the Lord answered him, and he said, nope, nope. Grace is sufficient. He said, my grace is sufficient. He answered the prayer. The answer was no, because he was doing what was best in the Apostle Paul's life. Amen. I promise you that you need to have a confidence that God will always do what is best for you. Amen. Even if it means disciplining you, because he loves you. Amen. And he disciplines those whom he loves, that we might partake in his holiness. Pray without ceasing. Well, I'm doing it again. We're going to talk... <laughs> The next part of this prayer, and yes, we're going, to, we're going to take it apart and look at it. Hallowed be thy name. Blessed be thy name. We're going to look at that in our next, our next session next week. Mm -hmm. So please be there. And tell others to be there. Yes. Join in. And don't forget you can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com or visit us on face, Facebook mm -hmm. at In Search of Christianity or at Bible Talk. Okay? We'd love to hear from you. Father, I thank you for the time that we do have together. And I thank you above all, Father, that your son Jesus Christ reconciled us to you, that we might call you, Father, that we might come running to you, Father, knowing that you love us so much. I praise you and thank you, Father, in the precious name, the only name given by which we can be saved, the name of your son, Christ Jesus. God bless you and goodbye. Till next time. I so I cherish that old rugged cross till